So our next speaker is Chris Hedges. Chris is a longtime war journalist, writer, and was an early and outspoken critic of the U.S. plan to invade and occupy Iraq. That's right. In 2002, he was part of a team of reporters at the New York Times who won a Pulitzer Prize for his paper's coverage on global terrorism. That same year, he won an Amnesty International Global Award for Human Rights Journalism. Chris has written numerous books on war, human rights, and American fundamentalism, including Collateral Damage and Just Out, Days of Destruction and Days of Revolt. So without further ado, Chris Hedges. Thank you. I'm in, the, uh, I'm in the middle of a book tour. I just flew in from San Francisco. I fly to LA tomorrow morning. I'm back here to speak in town hall on Monday night about the new book, Wages of Rebellion, The Moral Imperative of Revolt. But I came to support Shama because every action that we take now must be to destroy the corporate system of power in all of its manifestations. The time, the time for compromise and reform is over. What is taking place in this room is called a revolution. We have been lied to, manipulated, used, abused, and oppressed enough. It's over. I was in Boston two days ago with anti-fracking activists collecting petitions for Markey and Warren, and I said, drop it. We are no longer going to appeal to the centers of power. I said, the only thing you have to do, because they're building Kinder Morgan and Spectra pipelines to bring tar sands down through the city streets of Boston, is you have to get old junk cars, drive them in front of the equipment, take out the batteries, and walk away. Every single thing we do must be to send a message that we are going to destroy the structures of corporate power and take back our country. I teach in a prison in New Jersey, and I have taught at Princeton, Columbia, NYU, and these are the most sophisticated, intelligent, gifted, dedicated students I have ever had filled with more integrity and passion for learning than I have ever experienced in a classroom. And let's be clear why they're in prison. They're in prison because they are poor people of color who never had a chance in the judicial system. And I'm not going to protest I'm not going to protest outside of state houses anymore. I'm only going to protest outside of prisons. And we are organizing those prisoners. We are organizing those prisoners in what we hope will be a national campaign into a union so that they will receive the minimum wage and break the back of neo-slavery. Because once the prison industrial complex, which is a business, has to pay a fair wage, it will collapse.
Everything that we do now, every action that we take, has the moral imperative of revolt. It calls us to stand up to systems of power, monolithic systems of power, to systems of state repression and wholesale surveillance to the stripping away of our most cherished and basic civil liberties. And as many of you know, I sued the president in federal court over Section 1021 of the National Defense Authorization Act, which permits the U.S. military to carry out acts of extraordinary rendition on the streets of American City, and to the surprise of the White House, we won. This is why what is happening in Seattle is important, not only for the city of Seattle, but for the country, because you are setting an example of what cities across this country must do, and that is wipe out the Democratic and Republican parties and replace them. Replace them with socialists who are antagonistic to the forces of corporate power and will work in every way possible to drive corporate power back from our prisons, from our schools, from our health care service. Forces that have broken our unions and broken our capacity to resist, forces that have seized control of our media and dumped us with the most banal, ridiculous forms of indoctrination day after day. It all has to go. It has to go if we are to recover not only our democracy, but if we are finally to save the ecosystem on which future generations depend for life. These corporate forces are forces of death, and it is incumbent upon us to stand up for the forces of life. We can no longer ask whether we will succeed, whether it is practical, even if all the empirical evidence around us says that we will fail. We must rebel, not finally for what we achieve, but for who it allows us to become. I do not fight fascists because I will win. I fight fascists because they are fascists. And this is the fight of our life, the last fight. If we lose this one, we lose everything. And it begins tonight with you in this room with Shama Sawant. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to Shama Sawant and thank you to Seattle for leading the charge for all of us all across this nation. <laughs> this is the new battle in Seattle to get Shama to ensure that Shama returns to the Seattle City Council because she and Seattle are fighting for us all. No pressure, but what happens in Seattle will not stay in Seattle. You're doing this. Your victory for living wages 
Shama's victory, Seattle's victory, the workers' hard-fought victory is a victory for us all that lets us raise the bar all across the nation and call for a national living wage of 15 an hour. The coalition that Shama helped pull together for a people's budget is exactly the kind of coalition that we need to be pulling together all across the nation. Her fight for funding for social services, for raising the wages of the lowest paid city workers, this is a huge achievement that should be repeated all across the nation. Her success in bringing more resources to the, the homeless encampment in Seattle was long overdue. That should be repeated in the homeless encampments all over this country. Shama's fight to get new funding for a new women's shelter is critically needed all over this country. And her success with this coalition of increasing the funding for public transportation, of establishing linkage fees for affordable housing requiring developers to pitch in And her fight to stop, to fight against new youth jails, and the fight against racist brutality and police violence, these are fights that we must repeat and energize and intensify all across the nation. And likewise, what was that? Education, not incarceration, absolutely. Education, not incarceration. Education, not incarceration. Absolutely, at incarceration. These are the fights that we must repeat across the country. Shama's election showed what we can do with an independent left candidate who has the power of the people behind her and who is behind the power of the people. This is... So together, Shama and Seattle have been showing exactly what we can do with independent politics. And this is what people are clamoring for all over the country. We know that polls now show that nearly 60% of people are saying that the corporate Wall Street sponsored political parties have abandoned the American people. It's time for a new force in politics. And that new force, that new force is modeled on what you are achieving here in Seattle. In 2014, in the midterm elections, people voted. They voted with their feet by staying home in the lowest turnout election ever. That tells us what people want. They do not want more of the spineless, Democratic and Republican candidates that are in bed with corporate money and with the Wall Street predators. And it's no wonder, it's no wonder that people have had enough. Because one out of every two American families is now in poverty or heading towards poverty uh, under this predatory economic system. One out of every three African American men is held hostage by the violent and massive prison state, the racist prison state. 40 million American students and former students are held hostage by debt that makes them essentially indentured servants for the long haul. We 
We can fix this, but not inside of the Democratic Party. We have seen what the reform efforts inside the Democratic Party come to. They come to the administrations that we have seen under Barack Obama. They come to what was achieved under Jesse Jackson and under uh, Dennis Kucinich or Reverend Sharpton, which is, you know, a, uh, a feel-good moment, but a moment that ends with the Democratic Party continuing to march to the right and the progressive forces of independent politics having been corralled and brought back inside of the Democratic Party. It's time for us to stand up for independent politics and the future we deserve, not only in Seattle, but all across the nation. What happens in Seattle should not stay in Seattle. We must nationalize these victories. We must nationalize these struggles, demand living wages and union rights all across the country, health care, education, and housing as human rights, abolish student debt, make public higher education free, end police brutality and the racist prison state. begins here in Seattle. This fight has begun in Seattle. We must continue this in Seattle. We must get to victory. I will be doing my part as a presidential candidate to raise the profile over the course of the next many months so everyone knows about the struggle in Seattle. We will all be helping to ensure that Kashama wins. Donate to Kashama, get out and work for Kashama, right, knock on doors and uh, make those phone calls together. We will prevail in Seattle. We will prevail across the nation. Elect Shama. So next up, a visitor from very far away, Christos Giovanopoulos, who, yes, is a founding member of Solidarity for All, a grassroots net network of self-organizing solidarity, solidarity structures, and a member of Syriza, the ruling party of Greece. Thank you so much. Uh, it's a great honor for me and a big, um, uh, a very big, uh, big, uh, I'd say, um, responsibility to bring to you the solidarity of the Greek people. And also, and also I'm extremely pleased because the best news I've heard since I've been in this country, and this is my first time in this country, it is that a young activist that came from the grassroots, a young socialist, is, it holds a seat in a council, in a town council in, this, uh, in the metropolis of uh, capitalism and imperialism. <laughs> and I think, and I think this uh, victory a small victory, but a big start, the big first step, and it's a victory that we cannot afford losing it. So we should do whatever it takes in order to get Shama Swama again into, uh, the, into the council. As you know, as you know in Greece, the, the Greek people have suffered the most brutal assault of neoliberalism in order neoliberalism to get over its uh, crisis. But the Greek people, they refused to be the guinea pigs of this system. And they stood up. They resisted. They removed the two-party political system. And they put a left force in office in order to, 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 in order to open new ways of hope. But, but what we realize it is by being in the office doesn't mean that you have the power. Taking the power is not enough, or removing someone from power. What, it, what we should do, it is build power. Building power from the grassroots. 
And this is why Samas, uh, this is why Samas uh, re-election is important because we need people not only, we need representatives not only that serve the people, but they give space to the people to organize themselves. So this is what the grassroots solidarity movement has been doing in Greece. We speak about more than 350 solidarity clinics, solidarity food banks, uh, cooperatives, uh, self-organized uh, factories, etc. And for those that want to learn more about it, we have tomorrow a meeting in, uh, at 7 o'clock in the afternoon at the University Temple United Methodist uh, Church, and on Monday another solidarity forum uh, on, uh, in uh, Hillman City Collaboratory. So thanks again. I wish you all the best. We need you because we give us a common struggle. We cannot win without you. You cannot win without us. We're in all this uh, together and part of the people. Whoa, I had no idea there were so many people when I was back there. Um, comrades and friends, I'm delighted to be here in the US and in Seattle, and I bring solidarity from the Socialist Party in Ireland, which is a, a sister party of Socialist Alternative. Uh, uh, 100 years ago, the great Irish socialist and trade union leader Jim Larkin also came to America. He was planning a short stay, but he ended up staying for seven and a half years. It was a visit that included imprisonment and deportation for his anti-war activities. Um, instead, the Irish establishment, when they come to America, they present a bowl of shamrock to the White House. Uh, they bow down and fawn in front of American multinationals. They beg and plead for them to come to our country, to use it as a tax haven. The Googles, the Facebooks, the, Star, the, the Starbucks. Starbucks, for example, paid $37,000 in tax in seven years. I paid more than that in seven years. And, Unfortunately, I only have a few days here in America, but the purpose is the same as that of the brilliant Jim Larkin, who was a great trade union leader. It's to build links, it's to learn from the struggle here in America, it's to pass on any knowledge and assistance that we have, and it's to show solidarity and share ideas between all of us who want a better and a different world. Now, every time you clap, that's taken up my time, comrades, so please bear that in mind. Um, now, Chris Hedges has written about a corporate coup d'etat with no internal constraints, and we know exactly what he means, because as I left Ireland, Ireland's richest man, who's a tax exile, he's in the top 200 billionaires in the world, he's called Dennis O'Brien, was attempting not just to gag journalists from reporting on his business activities, but elected representatives in Parliament as well. His story is the epitome of the control of the planet by the billionaires. Now, we're told from the cradle that the rule of capitalism is we need these great risk takers, these venturers. It's vital for society to function. You've all seen The Apprentice, I assume. But Dennis O'Brien built his wealth on political patronage. That's the kind word for bribes and for connections and which has allowed him to acquire most of the media in Ireland, lucrative state contracts and write-downs on his debts. The most recent contract he's been awarded is the one for the water meter installation, which is going to gouge families of much needed, uh, it's going to profiteer from their necessity for water. Now the movement against the new water charges that have been introduced in Ireland represent a fight back after seven years of brutal austerity, where the speculative gambling debts of a tiny elite of the super rich were paid by working class and ordinary people. UNICEF have reported that children in Ireland have lost 10 years of income progress because of the bank bailout. 18% of our youth have emigrated. $16,000 has been taken out of the pockets and the futures of every man, woman and child in the country to bail out the banks. 
Meanwhile, our public services have been decimated. Now, this is mirrored, as you heard from the previous speaker, Christos, throughout Europe to different extents, Greece being the worst example, where there's a humanitarian disaster taking place in Greece, where suicide, prostitution, street begging are at epidemic levels because of the crisis of capitalism, so that the private debts of European banks could be shored up and capitalism itself could be saved. Now in Ireland, the, the anti-water char anti charges movement has given people at last a focal point to protest. It's given them the power to fight back. On October the 11th last year, we had 100,000 people marched on the streets of Dublin. Uh, on November the 1st, we had 200,000 people marching in local protests. And we're seeing this phenomenon throughout Europe where the left, where anti-austerity movements are increasing in support. Obviously, the election of Syriza in Greece, the first left government in Europe, is a huge step forward. Um, Podemos in Spain is another uh, trend as well. And we need to build a political challenge from the anti-water charges campaign as well to take on using the new activists, the new ordinary people that are becoming involved in political activity to take on the parties of austerity and the corporate agenda. It's a corporate agenda, as I said, that sees the country uh, fleeced by these multi multinational companies who pay little or no tax. They don't pay the headline rate, even though it's the lowest in Europe. While our homelessness doubles, people are sleeping in their cars and on the streets. And these signs of change, I, I'm, I'm glad to bring positive developments from Ireland. We had the historic vote for marriage equality. I'm proud. This is the, the first country that's had a popular vote on marriage equality and it's been passed in Ireland. Obviously, this is a really important achievement for the LGBTQ community to lift discrimination that they faced for decades. And it wasn't the establishment who granted it. It was that community itself who fought for that for decades. Instead, the Irish establishment has clung to the Catholic Church for 95 years. And what we've seen by that vote is that people are not willing to tolerate that situation any longer. I have to say, I've been involved in political activity for a long time, but it was really inspiring to see 66,000 people registered late to vote in the marriage equality referendum. 50,000 people flew home from all corners of the globe to vote. Um, young people, I heard about your door knocking, we call it canvassing, and young people volunteered to go canvassing on this issue like never before. Women, if you met women, they were most likely to be voting yes. But what is really, really important for people here to recognise is that in working class areas, the vote was the highest, 80% plus. Some, some of the most deprived communities that have been hit savagely by austerity voted 89%, 90% yes. And uh, there was queues at stalls to get buttons, uh, such as I have here. Um, and it's, it's just so important to recognise that working class people have broken most decisively with the Catholic Church. And we have to harness this movement to separate church and state now in our education system, in our health. We don't need archbishops sitting on the boards of maternity hospitals. We don't know what their gynecological expertise is, but it's certainly not there for the betterment of women. And most obviously, we now need to repeal the Eighth Amendment, the medieval amendment that outlaws abortion in our constitution that was put there in 1983 at the behest of a Catholic lobby who twisted the arms of a cowardly government. And no woman of childbearing age in Ireland has had a vote on that since. Even though thousands of women, of course, leave every year great expense, stigma and secrecy for abortions in Ireland. And we had, of course, the tragic death of Savita Halapanavar, an Indian woman in our country who was deprived of an abortion. Now, we anticipate, friends, a flood of funds from the anti for the anti-abortion campaign whenever it happens. 
from the US Christian right. We already know that the Westboro Baptist Church are very upset with Ireland for voting yes. <laughs> and Ireland is really upset as well. Um, so the battle to wrest control of the 1% is an international battle. And it has ever been thus. It's always been thus. The Irish famine which took place in the 1840s, who was it who sent aid and solidarity from America? It was the Choctaw people, the Native American people, who sent $170 Not the wealthy, but the, the most uh, deprived and persecuted people who'd already faced their own trail of tears 16 years before, sent $170 in a donation for the Irish famine. Uh, Calcutta as well. It's always the poor, the ordinary people, the working class who empathise and who spread international solidarity. And the 1%, they know the importance of international solidarity with each other. Do we, though? That's a really important question. We have to build links. Dennis O'Brien, I was researching um, the, the billionaire that I spoke of, has huge links with the Clintons, unfortunately. Uh, they, Bill Clinton flew over on his private jet to an economic forum in Ireland. This is why the election of Shama Sawant, why I've taken time out from my busy schedule to come here. Because Shama's election is an inspiration to you, but it's an inspiration to us as well. Because Europeans see America as an indomitable, an indomitable fortress of capitalism. Most Europeans would not even be aware that there is a left, that there are people campaigning for an alternative vision of society. It just would not be known uh, to people in Europe at all. So when lefts and socialists get elected and put forward in a, in a really principled way and a clear way, uh, left and uncompromising socialist ideas, that's actually vital for us in Europe as well to see. And in finishing, I appeal to everybody who's here today to get involved in Shama's campaign. It's already been said about the phoning, the door knocking, being an advocate for Shama in any way possible, whether it's introducing her to your friends and neighbours, bringing her to your local school, to meet other parents, whatever it is you can do, you can advocate and build support for her. But I'm also would say to people here tonight who've travelled to this fantastic, fantastic turnout on a Saturday warm night, become a socialist as well. Because... We need to build an alternative set of ideas to this system. And socialism are the only set of ideas that are an alternative to capitalism. A hundred years ago this month, I'll just finish on this, the great Irish socialist and trade unionist, as I said, Jim Larkin, who, who by the way, was a great advocate of women's suffrage and who came to the US to campaign against the slaughter of the First World War. But he said uh, a very important quote at a major rally in Madison Square Garden in New York in 1915. He said, it takes great men and women to stand up and say, we are socialists. We socialists are against war on the fields of battle, but we're also against a more brutal war, the war of capital against the men and women who are oppressed and have only their labor power to sell. We socialists want more than a dollar increase for the workers. We want the earth. Thanks, comrades and friends. Without further ado, I'm going to invite Shama to come out and speak to us tonight. I love you all too. <laughs> Sisters and brothers, thank you for being here today. 
Seattle has a choice, a choice between two visions for its future. In the vision taking shape for years now, our city, our city is being turned into a playground for the super wealthy and a profit machine for big developers, while most of us face a severe housing crisis. We face underfunded transit and education, strikingly inadequate youth job programs, even basic infrastructure. We face skyrocketing rents and increasing homelessness. We have the worst gender pay gap in the country. Racial disparities in our schools and our justice system are disgracefully all too alive. Wage theft is rampant. The historic LGBTQ and artist and activist communities in Capitol Hill and the black community in the Central District have been under siege from this developer-driven agenda. But our city is booming for others. A recent count found 80 construction cranes on the skyline of Seattle, many of which are being used to build luxury housing by the thousands. The major corporations based in our city and region are benefiting handsomely, their stocks and shares rising along with the new business towers downtown. I have a different vision for Seattle. A Seattle based on social justice, free from discrimination and poverty, where our city is a leader in mass transit and environmental sustainability. Where we have a powerful labor movement a working waterfront, and good paying union jobs across all sectors of our workforce. My vision, our vision, is of a city that is affordable and livable for the 99%, where young people retirees, all people are able to flourish and live in dignity. A city of equality between people of different colors, gender identities, immigrants or First Nations, a city which never for a moment forgets that black lives matter. I think this vision is worth fighting for. Do you think it is worth fighting for? election race in District 3 is unusual. Our growing movement has made it so. Our movement has fundamentally challenged 
the big business agenda in this city. As we all know, the corporate elite in Seattle have been used to owning politics. They are used to having their loyal servants at the wheel in control. When the Chamber of Commerce calls, they have become accustomed to most elected officials setting up in attention. When we called the corporate politicians out for interrupting city budget discussions for their visit to a Chamber of Commerce retreat, the politicians' defense was, well, this is how it's always been done. <laughs> What's the scandal here? We do this every year. Well, my sisters and brothers, that is the scandal. When I was elected to City Hall a year and a half ago, I did not arrive alone. Along with me were the aspirations of tens of thousands of people. Into City Hall many times now have come hundreds with me. Again and again, we have filled the chambers. Many people for the first time felt the sense of collective empowerment. Councilmember Nick Lakara and myself recently organized a town hall for affordable housing. <laughs> City Hall was filled by ordinary people in a way that it has not been in a long time. People demanded action with one voice on the housing crisis. They demanded rent control to make Seattle affordable. They demanded the city build thousands of units of high quality affordable housing, publicly owned, controlled, and maintained to finally provide an alternative to the market's spectacular failure. They demanded tenant rights, fair notice about major rent hikes, and a defense against economic eviction. So, has the establishment, the mayor, and the right wing of the council, have they got to work on affordable housing? No. Did the mayor press his housing committee to finally come up with something? No. He gave them another month's reprieve. He did respond, in a way, to our demands. He proposed a bill not to address the housing crisis, but a bill to attack free speech. It was an attempt to send a chilling message against all those of us organizing for housing justice. I objected. We all did. The National Lawyers Guild and the American Civil Liberties Union also objected, saying this bill is anti-free speech. This bill is an attack on the First Amendment. But rather than throwing the bill into the trash can, the right wing of the council followed the mayor's demands until they were stopped this very week by the city's ethics commission. <laughs> Corporate politicians, my sisters and brothers, need to be constantly reminded of the constitutional rights of the rest of us. The leadership for this city is coming not from corporate politicians, but from our movement. <laughs> a 
a movement that has included low-wage workers, labor unions, teachers and students, artists and activists, and the faith communities. Let us be clear, what we have won in social change has come because of our determination and sacrifice. Our coalitions that have been based on honesty and integrity, our clarity that the ruling elite may occasionally pay lip service to us, but almost single-mindedly serve the interests of big business. We have won the historic $15 an hour minimum wage. We built... We built action groups in neighborhoods across the city. We mobilized thousands to rallies, to marches, and into City Hall. I see many of you leaders of the Fight for 15 here tonight. I thank you. <laughs> McDonald's, Burger King, Starbucks, QFC, all of them will have to pay their workers at least 15 in a year and a half, January 2017. Thank you. The executives and the billionaires will hate it, but they have to accept it. Now campaign has gone nationwide. The massive metropolitan area of Los Angeles has just won 15. <laughs> Los Angeles has over 800,000 workers making less than 15. It all began here. SeaTac and Seattle began this historic movement against economic inequality. We have gone on here in Seattle to win millions in last year's budget for working people, to win services for the homeless, a year-round women's shelter. When the mayor denied, when the mayor denied the city's own lowest paid workers $15 an hour, we stepped in and made it happen to the People's Budget Movement. We established the Indigenous People's Day. Our movement stopped rent hikes of 400% in affordable housing at the Seattle Housing Authority. We took a stand against the disastrous anti-worker, anti-environment, trans-Pacific partnership. But make no mistake, the elite see one thing, and they see that clearly. They want this challenge to the status quo to stop. They want our movement to go away. They want to return to a cozy, quiet city hall, and they are behind the scenes negotiations. That's what I want to hear. And they will mobilize big corporate money this year and months of mudslinging and slimy personal attacks to try and get their way. We cannot let them win. No. 
We need to defend 15. We need to address the housing crisis. We need fully funded social services. We need to defend our seat in City Hall for working people. We will build on what we have won, and we will fight for our vision of this city. We will fight. We will fight for the interests of the 99%. For all of us, for all of us in City District 3, for everyone in this city. And we will work in solidarity and cooperation with people in other city districts. If we organize, if we organize, we can counter the power of big money, of big developers, of union-busting corporations flooding their cash into our district. Can we do this? Will we do this? Yeah. Sisters and brothers, our vision is inclusive of all human beings. By fighting for change in Seattle, we join the hundreds of millions everywhere who share our vision for society. A society that is free of oppression, war, and exploitation. A society that is based on global sustainability. That is why I am against corporate greed. And that is why I am a socialist. That is why I know we can only do this together or not at all. Working people, young people, the elderly, all of us need to get involved. We need to take our power into our hands collectively. I promise you, I will keep working relentlessly to give everybody who is marginalized a voice in City Hall. that, I will continue to use all the possibilities I have as a city council member to engage and activate the 99%. The powerful only appear so as long as we remain silent, and we won't. We will take the housing crisis head on here in Seattle. We will make the big developers pay to build affordable housing. We will fight to tax the super wealthy to fund mass transit and education. We will continue to show 
how to push back against corporate cash and corruption in politics. We can develop further this grassroots campaign to defend our seat on the city council, a campaign of mass involvement to push back against the money of Vulcan, the Chamber of Commerce, and the Restaurant Association, and the big developers. I thank you so much for your generous contributions today. More sacrifices will be needed. Please ask your friends and family to follow your lead and to donate. But this campaign also needs your hearts and souls. From now until August, and from August until November. Please fill in your volunteer form and hand it to the campaign staff. Help me with door knocking, postering, leafletting, and spreading the word. We have people's power. We have completely shifted the national discussion on inequality. We have already impacted the lives of millions with our leadership. Let us continue solidarity.